Just get over it. Get over it. Get over it. Just get over the fact that this invisible splinter is still aching in my finger on this quiet night. That the chains around my hands and my feet were fastened years and years ago. That the hearts of my loved ones were grilled over the sun. That when people hurl the words of darky, nigger, black boy at the local carnival are only joking around. That my childhood friends who were shunned because of the color they carried that their tears streaking down like rivers unattended drove them to silence their breathing on those cold winter mornings where I lived. Just get over it. Just get over the fact that when my mother saw teachers physically abusing us, school administrators ignored this black woman who was complaining about her twins having the right to a fair education. That my brother Eric came home one evening with fragments of glass in his back and hateful words trapped in his wounds. But we just mopped up the floors where his blood dropped in between the cracks because we were told to just get over it. Just get over the fact that when my heart changes this rhythm and rhyme, whenever a cop pulls up behind me in traffic, that my mind starts thinking about all of those evenings when they falsely accuse me as the fireworks go off into the darkened sky across the way. That my neighbors and friends think I'm lying as I try to explain what it's like. That I still cannot travel freely after dark in certain towns and cities. That a church, that a church of faithful souls who sing of amazing grace and love treat me with disdain and disgust. That a class falls asleep to these unspeakable horrors, past and present, sitting upon their feet mean nothing to them that the stones and the words greeting me are all in my head, that this invisible splinter still aching in my finger on this quiet night is not bothering them at all. I should just end this poem, pack up my stories, close my books, and just get over it. I am speaking with Stephen Moore, who is Associate Professor of English at Abilene Christian University and the Director of the McNair Scholars Program. And Stephen, we're talking about black rage of Sorry. all things. <laughs> uh, well, we don't think about you in black rage. You seem <laughs> like such a happy guy, pleasant, and what, what's black rage? Well, um, I, I guess it does surprise some people whenever I tell them that was my dissertation or I love writing on that and have a book that discusses black rage. And it surprises people, I think. But it, it's just about, I believe, it's, it's anger that many African Americans have while living in this country. What they've had in the past and what they, what they have today. So I've just always been fascinated with that subject while growing up and then when I went on to school and um, I, I don't know, it's just something about that topic that it just resonates with me on so many levels on a personal level, scholarly level, spiritual level that, um, you know, I just loved uh, to investigate. So uh, you wrote your dissertation in this uh, that's right. area. So that's right. it's first of all, what, a certain kind of literature? Who are the, who are the people that uh, kind of you, first got interested in. Right. Well, I first got interested in the slave narratives. And so Frederick Douglass and mm -hmm. Harriet Ann Jacobs, I started investigating slave narratives, and especially from them, and tried to find the historical roots for black rage. So then what I did, and you know this with the dissertation, just, you just try to narrow it down. Right. But I just concentrated on uh, those two or started off with those two and then worked my way up to today. And I also... Uh, investigated rage from Charles Chestnut and Nella Larson, um, and when they dealt with black rage right after uh, slavery had ended, and then I talk about the rage taking another um, shape or form, a contemporary appearance of black rage, and I love um, Richard Wright, uh, Langston Hughes, Alice Walker, to name a few, so I've decided to to listen to what the writers have to say about black rage in their literature. But then I was able to show how it exists in real life. Um, one person I'm studying right now, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, Between uh, the World and Me, 
and I think that was published a couple of months ago, but uh, he's dealing with an appearance, dealing with black rage, how it exists today in our country. Yeah, and it's very possible that a lot of our viewers have uh, read that book. If they haven't, they should. And I want to come back to that one um, in a bit. Um, uh, but I assume it's not just an academic interest right? Uh, with you. Right. Uh, oh, no. How is right. it... Um, how is it a personal? I think it's personal for me because of what what I saw with my own eyes with while growing up. So with my father, with my mother, with my grandparents, uncles and aunts, family members. And then, of course, what I dealt with. And so um, it was just all around me while growing up. So I saw it in, in my parents and saw it in, in my life and with my brothers. And um, I don't know, I think it really struck me when my twin brother and I would go to school together and we just experienced hatred um, at a very young age. And I'll never forget, you know, going to school and just the reaction from teachers and the reaction from students just always felt like something was wrong with me. And I knew it had something to do with the skin that I wore. And, um, and I, th I think, you know, this, um, so when I was a, a kid sitting in this kindergarten class, this, uh, first grade class, uh, this teacher would physically abuse, uh, students of color and it became, a just an awful, uh, situation for me, uh, for me and, and for my twin brother. But, um, I'll never forget when my mom um, but we were telling my mom, we were telling my dad about how we were being treated at this school, how we were being abused at this school. And I remember my parents wanting to uh, investigate, but my mom came out to the school and through the window of the school, she saw the teacher physically abusing us. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember when she was just outraged because of it and she took us. Um, out of that situation. And so we're sitting there inside of the car. Um, I'm buckling the backseat of the car, my twin brother, and then my mom is there. And uh, she kept taking out the keys and they just kept falling to the floor. And she would pick them up and they would fall down to the floor. But I remember, I remember my mom just, just crying. Mm -hmm. And, um, I knew something, I knew something was wrong. Yeah. So at a very young age, um, just dealing with rage, just experiencing mm -hmm. rage, at, at uh, rage of being oppressed or rage at the culture looking at me or looking at my family in a different way. Uh, but um, so that's a, a memory that, that I always uh, think of you know, it's hard to, to shake that off. But uh, yeah. uh, in the past, you've told me a, a story or two. Um, let's see, a friend. Was it Mark? Right. Oh, that's right. Tell Mark. Me, tell me about Mark. Right. Mark was uh, just a rambunctious kid, um, energetic kid, and we'll never forget him. But I just grew up with Mark. This is why we were living in Kansas. And at our school, you know how rough school grounds um, can be, how rough playgrounds could be. I just remember them always picking on him, picking on me, picking on people who were different, picking on people who were black. And so I'll never forget Mark because Mark, whenever the recess bell would ring, uh, he would just run out there to the slide and the swing set. And he wouldn't use the slide or the swing, but he would just hang there from the bars in between. And um, there were times when kids would surround him and they would just take all of their anger and just just hurl it his way. But I remember when they would just call him the N-word or who is this jungle bunny on the bars, they just said all these hateful, cruel words at him. And I just remember the look on his face while he would just hang there from the bars in between. So that would go on and I remember complaining to the teachers about it. I remember other students doing the same thing. I remember parents complaining to the school administrators, but our complaints just fell upon deaf ears. 
And Mark got tired of being bullied. He got tired of being harassed. And so um, one morning, he decided to end it all. So in his backyard, there's a slide and a swing set. And he just took some rope and just ended his life. Mm -hmm. And I'll just never forget how neighbors responded to that. Never forget people just seeing this scene, seeing this commotion. But uh, this black boy just just hanging there, um, really disturbing uh, mm -hmm. image and just hard for me to, you know, it's another image that's, that's hard for me to let go. But mm -hmm. whenever I'm teaching about race or teaching about uh, this topic, I always, I always think of Mark, always mm. think of Mark mm. hanging there. Mm. And uh, the frustration I had of our neighborhood, our school, our community not doing enough about right. race. Because I think they would hear all the complaints, but um, they would just go the other way. Right. So. And I, I've met your brother briefly. Oh, that's right. You've, yeah. you've told me a story about him coming in one night right like, right like, eric my, yeah. my oldest brother yeah right so this is uh this was in montgomery alabama yeah. and once again you know we're living in a very racially hostile uh environment but eric my oldest brother was uh attacked by a hate group in our town there mm -hmm. and so i remember as a young boy uh when that incident happened and he's coming through the front door and of course he's sobbing and he is taking his shirt off and there's uh, fragments of beer bottle uh, of glass uh, hit in the floor. And so there's blood and there's glass. And just remember my mom and my dad um, feeling so frustrated because I think they wanted to be able to protect him. Right wanted to be able to protect us. But um, just remember my mom and dad just clean up the blood and just trying to calm us down. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that. I, um, and I want to, you know, kind of kind of as we get into this, I want one more story I want us to uh, think about. Uh, you've, to, you've told me about your first, uh, your first job. Can you? Oh, can yeah. You, <laughs> you know, that's, the, uh, that's right. Now, are you talking about the Walmart job or when I was? No, I'm talking oh. about when you're, uh, well, I didn't even know you worked at Walmart. Oh, that, that's I, right. I, it, you and I that. have that connection. We worked at Walmart. Yeah, so. yeah we both worked at Walmart. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, when you're on your way to Nebraska for your first your Oh, first yes. Job. Yes, that's that's right. That's right. So that, I had my first uh, teaching job in Nebraska. And so I was working at uh, York College at the time. Uh, that's why I first got my master's degree. So I was hired to teach at York College and then also to teach at uh, University of Nebraska. But um, I remember how excited I was and um, getting a, uh, an apartment with some friends and, you know, having a full time job. Right. But uh, I was happy to get my first brand new sports car. Uh, so it was a Dodge Avenger and uh, got that sports car. But uh, one of one evening, I was driving to Lincoln, Nebraska, and I had my roommate in the car with me, and his name is Jeremy Helm, just a great guy. Um, he's a firefighter right now, but anyways, um, he, so he was in the car with me, and we're driving into Lincoln, and I wasn't speeding at all, and then all of a sudden, this cop pulls us over, pulls me over, and the police officer comes up to my window, and he... And he says, uh, his, the first question that he um, asked me was, does this car belong to you? And so I told him, of course, the car belonged to me. And I showed him the receipt that I had for the car and all the registration paperwork and things like that. But he didn't believe me. And then he asked, what, what is it that you do for a living? I said, well, I'm, a, I'm an English professor at your college. And he said, um, I, I know you're lying. Uh, get out of the car. And so, of course, he's raising his voice. He's yelling at me. He thinks I'm lying to him. He thinks I'm deceiving him. And so he started searching me. He thought I had a weapon on me, so I had to empty my pockets. But he patted me down. Then he put me 
into the passenger seat of his car and just quizzed me to death and called for backup. Um, and then my roommate is seeing all this and he just cannot believe what's going on. Mm-hmm. And we've had discussions. Like I had discussions with my roommate and um, not only him, but with o- other friends and people I went to church with about what's like growing up in America and being racially profiled. He was just ballistic. And um, I, I think he was just gravely disturbed, just couldn't believe it with his own eyes. You know, and I, I think, you know, my, my, my reaction to that, to that series of stories is, my goodness, this isn't the 1860s. Mm. Right. You know, this isn't even the 1960s. Right. This is what's going on right. today. I think it's so far out of yeah. some of our experiences. That really? Right. right. That's what it's like. Right. You're exactly right. And even what's going on in the media where we hear yeah. about unarmed black men yeah. being detained and many of them being killed. And I think sometimes it's hard for people to understand and to believe. Yeah. Because I think with the stories that I would tell people or the stories my parents would tell people or some of my black friends, people would just say, you've got to be kidding me. That does yeah. not go on yeah. in civilized America. Yeah. But um, I, I think it is a problem. And I'm not saying that every single police officer out there right. is racist, but there's a problem with our, right. with our legal system, our justice system. Yeah. Um, okay, so here, herein, herein lies our problem. Uh, you know, it's hard to hear that without thinking, okay, you've got plenty to be angry about. Right. And you also have this call to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to practice radical love and forgiveness. How do, how do you bring black rage and right. those Christian commitments? How do those, right. how do those come together? How are you working that out? <laughs> right. Well, I tell you what, it, it's a challenge. Uh, it's yeah. difficult. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of James Baldwin. He says this in his writings and in his speeches. He says, you know, to be black in America you know, if you're conscious and if you're black, you're always in a constant state of rage. Mm. And so I'll never forget when he says that. So I, I think what what I tried to do is, of course, my parents really were amazing examples for me of, of love, of radical love and forgiveness. And they, of course, you know, taught Christ to me and and shared with me ways of, of dealing with the pain, of dealing with rage. So I'm just so thankful to God for my parents. Um, but another personal story that I tell my students, I tell my colleagues, is when um, I applied to teach here at ACU. And this was years ago, almost about 15 years ago. And I remember going through uh, the hoops and filling out all the paperwork. And Daryl Tippins was trying to <laughs> recruit me, trying to pull me away from uh, Nebraska, but he called me up one day and it was Daryl and we, we had a friendship because of conferences. And he said, you should think about applying to ACU. I think you'll love it here. This is a great department. It's a great place. And so I took a look at ACU and, and fell in love with the faculty and fell in love with staff and fell in love with just the students. There was something special about this place. So, um, you know, I, Days went by, weeks went by, and I decided, you know, I'm going to go ahead, and I think God is calling me to come to ACU. And um, so after teaching for about um, two or three months, that's when my parents uh, sat me down and shared with me what happened between ACU or ACC at the time and my father. And so we're sitting there at the kitchen table, and my dad is saying, I just want you to know that when I was a high school student, I wanted to go to a Christian school. And um, he had top grades, top scores, and he applied to ACC. And he got a rejection letter. And they said in the letter, and he still has uh, the letter to this day, the, the letter said that uh, because of his skin color, because he's black, that you cannot, you cannot come here. You're not welcomed here. And my parents never shared that with me at all. Mm. Even when I applied, even when I signed on the dotted line, they never shared that with me. Um, 
my dad, of course, was at the time full of rage. And of course, my mom um, was someone who also grew up in that climate of uh, having rage. But I, I never forget my dad saying, you know, out of all the schools I wanted to attend to attend as a, as a college student, and I wanted to go to a Christian school. I was denied. I was rejected. But what I find truly amazing that is that they were able to forgive. Mm. They were able to forgive. My parents have no anger at all mm. towards ACU. Mm. Um, but what I think is so ironic is that, you know, the university that denied the father, um, you have the son working hired there. Hired the son. Yeah, they hired the son. Yeah. And so um, what was really emotional for me is when I had my parents here at ACU and I'm up there teaching. And so I have my mom and dad standing in the back of the classroom. And, uh, you know, just can't believe it. But, I mean, think about the power, the power of Christ and the power of forgiveness. Yeah. And... Um, Rejected, and yet you have got the son up there yeah. teaching at yeah. at ECU. So I, I think that those are just um, those what they did. I mean, that just speaks volumes for me in terms of how to deal with rage yeah. every day. And so I think it's back and forth, uh, learning how to. I think it's important for people to hear the rage, to hear the stories, but for me, writing or trying to find a way of channeling that rage in a positive way, but then also um, trying to tell people, okay, this rage is real and you need to hear what black Christians, what African-Americans, what minorities are going through while living in this environment, but then also there's love and forgiveness. So I think it's just back yeah. and forth. The bars. Each time at recess, Mark bullied his way through the crowds, waiting to use the slide and swing set. He never used the slide or swing. He would just hang there from the bars in between. Kids took their anger through words that pierced him while he remained frozenly silent. He hung there with a stony face hiding behind the bars. It was a bright Monday morning and the wind kept knocking on our kitchen window. It told me that I didn't have to worry about Mark anymore. Nobody had to worry about him again. The swing set in his backyard tried to talk, but couldn't. A tear tried to streak down his cheek, past his crooked chin and black mold. A small stream of blood trickled from the left side of his mouth. Around his rough neck, a rope hung mysteriously from the bars between the slide and swing. This morning, his black, lonely eyes stood silent. I stood there. Neighbors stood there. All of us stood there, silently. Tears streamed down my face as I swallowed the bitter, ruthless sky. I looked around and I saw his face. I saw his eyes. And then I saw the bars. And most of our, most of our uh, viewers are uh, uh, church leaders. And, um, You know, the last couple of years haven't been great in terms of race relations in the right. United, United States. And, you know, I think many of them are sort of on board in terms of, yeah, I want to I want to do something to help. Right. But I think they're also often lost as to as to what to do. So what, what would right. you want to say to them or what would you want to say to me? What would you want to say to white Christians? Say, OK, hit, right. this is right. This is what you can do. Right. Right. I think it's an excellent question. I, I think to, first of all, listen to the stories, to be patient and listen to the testimonies, listen to the stories of people who are being disenfranchised, pe people who are being oppressed. Be patient and just listen. I think 
and you know this, whenever I get go into the classroom and you try to have a discussion, and no matter what the controversial subject is, but if the conversation is on race, I've noticed that whenever I'm trying to lay it all out there, people are quick to just jump in there and interrupt. And I think we we are very poor listeners in this culture when it comes to matters of race. So I think being patient and listening to the stories and then doing something, doing something, rolling up your sleeves and helping your brothers and sisters who are being oppressed, who are being disenfranchised. And I think when I, you know, to go back to that book, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates mentions all these governmental policies, housing policies designed to keep blacks away from whites, redlining and um, saying that you can't live here and you can't live there. And he says what people can do, you know, one thing they can do is to become actively involved in the government or actively involved in politics or in the culture in terms of addressing these injustices, to try to be a voice, but not only a voice, to roll up your sleeves and do something physically to get rid of racism, to eradicate racism in our culture. And I'm just finding more and more people where they're excited about reading or they're excited about going to lectures, but I don't find enough people who have enough passion to to really want to do something mm. to get rid of uh, these problems that we have. Um, Co Coates' book has certainly drawn more attention than than anything that's been written in several years on on race, and it is eloquent. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. It's also gotten some criticism because it's so relentlessly pessimistic. Right. Uh, for those who haven't read the book, it's it's him kind of giving advice or writing letters to to his son. Um, are you pessimistic? Are you optimistic? <laughs> do you not? Are you not even think in those terms? I mean, we, you know, we have sounded a hopeful note that the school that rejected your father because of race now right. is the school that's hired the son. That, but I guess there's plenty to be pessimistic about too. Do you do you think in terms of pessimism or optimism? Right. Or you just don't think in those terms. Right. Well, I think maybe I embrace both. Yeah. Although maybe it depends on the day. Well, because you're right, when I watch uh, on TV what's going on in America or reading the papers, sometimes I, you know, I'm tempted and I, I am pessimistic, to be honest. But then there are times where, most of the times I should say this, I, I, I am optimistic. Mm -hmm. And because of what you said, especially because of my uh, parents and because of, of you, friends that I have, colleagues that I have, students that I have who are passionate in doing something about these problems, that makes uh, me hopeful. Mm. That makes me think that, oh, I think we can experience uh, the light. Mm. And I, I think sometimes what we forget as Christians, especially when we are going through awful atrocities in the culture, and even with this political season and what's going on right now, this day and age, there's just so much hate, I think, as Christians, we ought to try and bring, lift Christ up, lift mm -hmm. Christ up, bring the light, let the light come in. And so would it make sense to talk about a Christian black rage, a, a black rage that has this passion uh, for justice and says there are some things that just can't stand, right. but is infused with this gracious love of Christ. Can those things right. can I, those things reside together? I, I think, I, I believe so. I, and I, I love that. Uh, I, I love that term, yeah. uh, Christian rage or Christian black rage. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. I, I think you're right. I think that that should, um, people should have that or should have this passionate anger to want to do something uh, for change to occur. I have people come up to me right now with, with tears in their eyes where they say, I was alive when that took place, when we were doing that to black students. And I was silent. Mm -hmm. And I knew in my heart, I knew when I would read scripture, I knew when I studied Christ, I should have said something, I should have done something. So I had people come up to me and they said, man, I'm so sorry that I didn't say something when blacks are being denied um, admission to ACC. And so I, I think, Let's go ahead and have that 
exist. Let that rage inspire you um, to do good, to do good, to do wonderful things, to help people. Mm. And uh, I guess at the end of the day, that's, that's where I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm hoping that people will go ahead and put that into action. Yeah. When I think about it, you know, the one I call Lord and Savior was an outsider. Right. And uh, he's outside of political power. He's right. Outside, right. He's outside of cultural power. He's, he's the ultimate outsider, and that's the one that I call Lord. Right. Amen. Yeah. I agree. And it's something else. Um, social media, when you read like Facebook or anything else out there on social media. And I read all the time where people are paying allegiance to, you know, I'm, I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat or I believe in this person or that person. And all of these fights are occurring left and right. But I, I, I love that about Jesus Christ. And you're exactly right. Being the outsider. And that's where it becomes tough for somebody to say, you know, I'm a Christ follower and I'm going to do what he does. And I'm going to speak out against injustices, even if I'm the only one speaking out against injustice. I'm going to do that because Christ, the outsider, does exactly that. And I, I think um, it's just so easy for us to just fall underneath the umbrella of a political party or or a certain movement when we really, really ought to belong to a, a movement that's headed by Christ. Yeah. And I did the just, Jesus party. Oh, for Jesus, right. <laughs> the Jesus party. That's right. That's right. You're exactly right. Um, because I think it's so funny when people get all excited and they put these bumper stickers on. This is who I'm supporting. This is who I am. And I think it's uh, something when the, the world looks at us and we're telling them I'm Republican or I'm Democrat or, you know, I'm this follower instead of I'm all about Jesus. A perfect day. No more sounds of ambulances ice skating across our streets. No more daily medications to take. No more crutches, no more wheelchairs parading in our hospitals. No more pain threatening to take us hostage. We simply long for closed signs to hang upon front doors of funeral homes, and for April afternoons to play on swings, and for June and July to build sandcastles while death, disappointments, and deadlines are finally buried bullies beneath our feet. Only clouds, birds, sunlight, only your love, and your embrace exists here and nothing else. <laughs>